Dead Stripper, Chapter 3, Scene 7. I'm still behind the media station apartments, staring at a six-foot chain-link fence with a steep drop-off on the other side. A trash dumpster sits next to me on the right, and parked cars are lined up behind me on the left and right. I back up slowly, then turn the wheel a little and pull forward slowly, only way to avoid bumping any of the cars parked on both sides of me. Two more backups and pull forwards before I finally turn all the way around. Then I get going a little, but here comes a car with its high beams blinding me. Come on, pal, give me a fucking break. Barely enough room to squeeze past each other, but this son of a bitch isn't slowing down. Should I stop and let the asshole pass, or take my chances and keep going? Fuck him. Damn the torpedoes. Full speed ahead. We almost sideswipe, but pass without colliding. The car looks like a Beamer. Too dark to see the driver's face, but definitely a man behind the wheel. I turn on the Uber app and immediately get a request. Jessica, 1030 East Lancaster Avenue, Rosemont. The app sets the parameters of 13 miles and 19 minutes to reach the pickup location. I retrace my route back through media, then get on the blue route and head northbound. Not much traffic. Only takes 15 minutes to reach my exit, then another four minutes to reach the pickup location. It's a condo called the Radner House. It sits off to the right. It's 10 stories tall, but looks taller because it's perched on top of a hill. I start up a crescent-shaped driveway and call the rider halfway up the hill. A female's voice answers, Hello, this is your Uber driver. I'm right outside the entrance in a silver SUV. Thanks, she says, getting on the elevator now. Two minutes pass. Then the sliding doors open. Then the sliding doors open automatically, and a female exits the building. Looks attractive. A little better than average height, with blondish hair, trim and athletic looking, and wearing tight jeans and a navy sweater. She starts walking toward the passenger side. I lower the window on her side. She reaches my vehicle, then looks through the open window. Steve? Yep. She opens the back door and gets inside. I close the window. Where are we going? Phoenixville, she says. Know where it is? Yep. You live there? No, nah, she says. I live here. Don't mind me for being curious, but if you live here, why are you going to Phoenixville at this hour? Just decided to spend the night at my parents' place. No kidding. Guess you could say, she says, I had a fight with my boyfriend. And in case you haven't noticed, I've been drinking. Doesn't show. Believe me, she says. I've been drinking wine all day, and I can really feel it now. No way I'm driving. Last thing I need is a DUI on top of everything else. Smart move. I hit start trip and see her destination, 909 West Ridge Drive, Phoenixville. The app says 30 minutes and 16 miles. I do some quick factoring and realize it'll be almost 2 a.m., by the time I drop her off. So I put the car in gear and we're on our way. I'm not usually like this, she says, but I got fired today. I got fired once, not a whole lot of fun. Plus, I think you're never going to find another job. Starting to feel like that already, she says. What kind of work you do? Bartender at the Paramore, she says. At least I was until today. Interesting name. Once bought a gym membership for my girlfriend and wrote Paramore to describe our relationship. But no one knew what it meant. I don't either, she says. Literally, it means for love. It usually implies an illicit partner to a married man, pretty much the same as mistress. Oh, but I used it wrong. How's that? Neither one of us were married. Ergo, nothing illicit going on. Should have just said girlfriend, but I was trying to show off. Thanks for the vocabulary lesson, she says. Welcome, but why'd you get fired? New owner, she says. He brought in a new manager, and the new manager wanted to hire his girlfriend, so he made up some bullshit excuse, and I was out. How long did you work there? Going on five years, she says. Great job. Made enough to afford the condo where you picked me up. Impressive. Mainline address. Not cheap. Tell me about it, she says. But I never planned on being a bartender in the first place. No? Nah? What do you want to be? I graduated from the Art Institute in Philly, she says. But it didn't take long to figure out that being an artist wasn't in the cards. Why not? Not good enough, she says. And trust me, I make a lot more tending bar than I ever would painting pictures. So, let's face it, I'm a bartender. Nothing wrong with that. 
I had to get into art to begin with. My art teacher in high school pushed me, she says. I could draw a little, and being an artist sounded romantic. I know where you're coming from. I want to be a mystery writer. That sounds romantic to a lot of people, but I haven't sold a single story so far. So that's where the romance ends and reality begins. So for now, I'm a glorified taxi driver. How's that working out for you? She asks. Pays the bills, set my own hours, plenty of flexibility, plenty of time to write. I see, she says. And how do things stand with your girlfriend? What girlfriend? Your paramour. Ah, oh, I chuckle. Old news, no girlfriend. Not even one, she asks. Nope. Why not? Ambition? Ambition. I don't get it. Ambition's my Shakespearean tragic flaw of character. Since when is ambition a flaw, she asks. Not usually, but in my case, it is. How so? Like I said, I want to be a mystery writer so bad. But all my stories keep getting rejected. Why? No idea. I think they're pretty good. But she says you still keep trying, right? Yep. But getting a story published is just my initial goal. Then comes a book, then more books, and then seeing one of my books turn into a movie or a Netflix series. You do have some pretty lofty goals, she says. But maybe ambition isn't your tragic flaw after all. No? What is? Maybe ego is your tragic flaw, she says. How so? Hate to say it, but maybe, like me, being an artist, you're just not good enough to be a writer. Hmm. Never looked at it that way. Hope you're wrong. But either way, ambition or ego, I'm determined to make it. Where do you stand now? I submitted another story last week, so I'm waiting to hear back. What do you do for fun, she asks. Not much. All work and no play make Jack a dull boy, she says. Huh, then just call me Jack. But enough about me. You still didn't tell me about the fight with your boyfriend. Oh, that, she says. Getting fired was a real downer. Never saw it coming. Tried to contact him, you know, looking for some sympathy. Called him and texted him, but the dick ignored me. How long you been going out with this guy? Met him in art school, she says. Then, then we bumped into each other at a party last year, and one thing led to another. What's he do? Owns his own business, she says. A startup. Can I ask you a question? Shoot. And get an honest answer? Shoot. If you were in his shoes, she says, would you call me or at least text me? No, no. No way you're getting me in the middle of this. Seriously, she says, what would you do? Um, Honestly, if you were someone I cared about, really cared about, I'd get back to you ASAP. There's a Wawa up ahead, she says. Would you be so kind to stop? I need to put something in my stomach, you know, a donut or something to suck up the alcohol. I pull into the Wawa parking lot and find a spot in front. She gets out, comes around to my side, and stops alongside my window. I lower the window. You want something, she asks. Nah, I'm fine. Thanks anyway. My treat, she says. Really, I'm fine. I want to get you something, she insists. Okay, you win. I'll take a blueberry donut. No way they have any blueberry donuts, she says. Seriously, what do you want? Trust me, it's against my principles to lie. They have blueberry donuts. Don't worry, she says. I'll surprise you. She walks away and enters the Wawa. Scene eight. Three or four minutes pass. She exits carrying a small paper bag and comes right over to my window. I lower the window. They did have blueberry donuts, she says. Told you so. Would you mind if I sit up in front, she asks. No, not at all. She walks around the front of the envoy, opens the door, and gets inside. Couldn't believe they had blueberry donuts. Got one for myself, too. Look, are you in a hurry? Not really. Why? Then go through Valley Forge Park, she says. It takes a little longer, but it's a nicer ride. I set course for Valley Forge Park. Scene 9. The donuts are long gone by the time we reach a narrow road leading into the park. We passed a handful of cars on the way here, but now we're the only vehicle on the road. Without any other headlights, the ride's dark. We're talking openly and getting to know each other little by little. Under different circumstances, some might call it romantic. Suddenly, she touches my right bicep gently. I glance at her hand momentarily, then look back at the road. Now both her hands are caressing my right bicep. Do you mind if I touch you like this, she asks. Does it make you feel better? 
In my current state of affairs, she says, and my current state of alcohol consumption, she giggles. Yes, yes, it does. Then I don't mind at all. Call me crazy, she says, but I just came up with a slight change of plan. Like what? I'd like to buy you a drink, she says. No problem. When do you want to get together? You don't understand, she says, right now. I want to buy you a drink right now. It's almost one o'clock and we're in the middle of nowhere. This is where I grew up, she says. I know a place where we can get a drink, still open and not far from here. Scene 10. It takes six minutes to reach a one-story building. It's standing by itself on a small lot and the sign's still lit. Black Horse Tavern. It looks pretty much like your corner bar, but we're in the middle of nowhere. Only three cars parked in the lot, spaced far apart. Makes it easy to pull into the spot near the entrance. Next thing I know, we're holding hands as we enter. It's casual inside, almost country, with a long U-shaped bar and several big screen TVs on the walls. And there's a pool table at the end of the room with two guys shooting pool. I have to go to the ladies' room. She releases my hand. But you don't have to wait for me to order. She keeps walking toward the far end of the building. No one's at the bar, so I sit on the stool closest to me. The bartender comes right over. What can I get for you? Bottle of bud, but I want to wait until she gets back. No problem. He walks away. I sit there watching the two guys shooting pool. Jess returns a little while later, kisses me on the cheek, and sits on the stool next to me. The bartender returns. What can I get for you folks? Jess turns her head toward me. Bottle of bud, I tell the bartender. No glass. And you? The bartender asks Jess. I've seen you before, Jess tells the bartender, but don't know your name. Jimmy. I'm Jess. Pleased to meet you, Jess, the bartender says. What can I get for you? Same as Steve, she says, but I'll take a glass. The bartender nods and starts walking away. Jimmy, she calls out. The bartender stops and turns back to face her. And I'll take a shot of Cuervo. She turns to face me. Want a shot? Nah, I'm good. My treat, she says. Thanks, but I still have to drive home. The bartender starts to walk away again. Jimmy, she calls out again. He stops walking, turns back to face her. Make that a double. So, that's it for Chapter 3. Next up, Chapter 4.